minute here. Um, Dr. Werb, um, I, I'm going to go to you. What have you observed in terms of, um, you know, uh, safe supply in terms of how it's being described in the media or by critics versus how safe supply is actually operated? And can you tell us where the media and critics are misrepresenting the evidence on safe supply? Sure. So I, I don't know if anyone is willfully trying to misinterpret or misrepresent anything. Um, I will note that I'm the principal investigator of a national uh, evaluation of safer supply pilot programs in Canada that's funded by Health Canada and uh, run by Canadian Institutes of Health Research. I can speak a little bit about that. I think, you know, one of the issues that um, that I find troubling is that there is this conflation of quite a number of different approaches into this idea of safer supply or this term of safe supply. So sometimes when people are talking about safer supply, they're talking about regulating the uh, currently unregulated drug market, which I would be happy to talk about. Sometimes they're talking about prescribed clinical guidelines, which are um, you know in place in British Columbia. Sometimes they're talking about pilot programs, like the ones that uh, our national evaluation is studying, which are integrated into existing harm reduction and um, social care programs, right? And all of these programs are very different. The, in, in these programs, generally, um, safer supply is a component of a broader, comprehensive approach to meeting the needs of, um, of clients or members or patients. All of these programs uh, refer to their um, you know these people differently, and I would say that you know I I I, I would echo Dr. Humphreys that the the evidence is still emerging. Right, these are programs that have been in place only for you know two to three years, um, but I really want to make the the point here that the prescribed safer supply guidelines in BC are quite different. Like these are just. Uh, the opportunity for clinicians to provide a particular type of medications for a particular condition among their, their patients, which are different than these uh, um, wraparound integrated pilot programs. So we, we know OxyContin <coughs> is not safe supply. OxyContin and caused a fraction of overdose deaths compared to fentanyl. You know, we saw overdose deaths in the U.S. grow to 275% between 2016 and 2021, more than Canada, which doubled. Um, Alberta, you know, we can look at their, their record. I mean, April, they had a record amount of overdoses. Um, Lethbridge, they've already surpassed it uh, by August this year, last year, which was a record year. They've closed their safe consumption sites. Can you talk about the effectiveness of harm reduction interventions like drug checking, supervised safe consumption sites, how many lives are saved? Sure, and I'll say, you, you know, in the case of Alberta, just to note that only about 5% of um, fatal overdoses are have um, prescribed overdoses implicated in them, or pardon me, prescribed opioids implicated in them. Um, uh, you know, I'll just echo what I said earlier around supervised consumption sites, right? Like we, we have worked with the um, Chief Coroner's Office of Ontario to map uh, overdose mortality across the city of Toronto and uh, year over year. And what we found was that, you know, and it's, it's pretty remarkable up to five kilometers away, we saw about a two-thirds reduction in the rate of overdose mortality across neighborhoods. And so, you know, we're trying to figure out why that is, because that's a really powerful, powerful effect. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We Dr. think that, you know, beyond people's access to these uh, programs on site, that they're also hubs of, of harm reduction services, right? These are places Thank where you, people Dr. feel Wood. safe going where they can pick up naloxone, Thank where they're you, provided Dr. with safer uh, education Thank about you. how to we're, how to avoid overdose. We're, we're and that's time. really, really critical. We're